have all seen the stereotype, a monk that leaves society to reside in the mountains at a monastery where he speaks no words and hears no words spoken and has no access to pleasures and stimulation for an undetermined amount of time. The monk also does a tremendous amount of physical labor before the rest of the night is spent sitting the fuck down and shutting the fuck up, eventually returning to society after becoming, um, enlightened. Today's culture will not hesitate to roll both eyes at the sound of that archetype in the same way that Pavlov's dog would salivate at the sound of a bell that it was programmed to associate with food. So why are we programmed to roll our eyes? Well, this practice seems awfully boring, doesn't it? But why does the monk leave society? Well, he is either fed up with its drama or in despair due to ignorance of his own self. Why does he sit in silence without contact with worldly pleasures like entertainment. Well, the unspoken science of this practice has shown that when we fast from pleasures and instant gratification, the brain begins to produce its own chemical output of dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin without an outside force to beckon it. And lastly, why does he return to society after this time is sacrificed? And uh, that question we can get to later. This particular practice is one of many formats used worldwide to accelerate the process of self-completion. And note, I didn't say betterment, by the way. I said completion. Some time ago, I found myself confronted with events that, to me, meant only devastation and failure. The entire foundation that my feet walked on and depended on crumbled into rubble and I was falling into complete loss with absolutely no answers or correct direction. Even after years of esoteric study, including alchemy, I found myself blind. The events happening outside of my control made me unable to see. Once blind to all potential and silver linings, I, I gave up, and that is putting it mildly. I gave up so much that I moved away and into an old house that I could afford, but needed repair as much as I did. I still don't know why, but after moving in, I left out all devices that make contact with the outside world, knowing in a way that this would in fact worsen my pain and loss. I didn't pull out a phone or install a TV. I didn't go to parties, events, or even out to eat. In fact, the meal meals I had were not prepared, but instead were just the minimal amount of substance I needed to live. It'd be like a handful of spinach right out of the bag or just a straight carrot. Weeks went by and the only thing I did was renovate the house and that work had to be forced. Eventually, I felt a spark one day out of nowhere that was faint. The next day, it was bigger. Eventually, it was an unignorable fire that consumed my entire previous identity. Weird as it sounds, I was gone, and what replaced me was this spark that I simply allowed to take over my persona. The I that I was familiar with was a memory at best, like a dream that happened last night. It was separate from me in a way that I could actually see it and all of its habits and patterns clearly. It was as if I had been for years trying to see the bottom of a pond by moving the water out of the way and only kicking up more mud to cloud the water. After completely giving up, the water rested and the dust settled, becoming still. Glancing back at the pond, the bottom was clear to see and observe. Without analyzing or overthinking, I busted out the camera and microphone that I had been using for years on violent head heavy metal music, and I filmed myself talking hella shit about Saturn. And if you're watching this, I don't have to tell you what happened next. I didn't realize at the time that I encountered and lived through an ancient practice that has been called by many names, but most familiar to us here in the West as a dark night of the soul. So in 1578, St. John of the Cross had some ideas that got his ass thrown into prison by his fellow Carmelite brothers who opposed his, his new ideas. What he wrote down while imprisoned was to become a legendary portion of a much bigger picture. 
He wrote what's considered to be a poem called Dark Night of the Soul. This metaphorical night works like a slingshot in a way that the further back it is pulled and the more tense it gets, the more accelerated the sentient growth will be. We can see how this works in, in the stages here. To be clear, this process is not to be confused with depression, but more of a phase that must be allowed to happen. It cannot be fast forwarded or covered up and hidden. There's no going around it, but like the serpent at the front of the cave guarding the treasure, we have to go through it to embody its benefits. It seems as though, in a way, death leads to life in more than one sense. And although referred to in Buddhism as falling into the pit of the void, uh, f it, this process is a necessary part of people's spiritual evolution. Shannon Kaiser is quoted as describing it as a breaking away from the illusions of fear and ego to shift our alignment and values to what is real and true, the connection to the divine, and ultimately pave the way for your life's purpose and mission here on earth. Within the stages of this process, there seems to be a common theme. The first stage is a sort of disruption and certainty. You will not be prepared for this. The more persona that the person is holding on to, the worse this beautiful process is going to be. Those addicted to former ideals of things around them being a certain way will have the most trouble. Stage two is running completely out of hope and meaning. This sounds negative, but it is it's necessary as we will see. At this stage is when a person without the wisdom of sacrifice and alchemical transmutation will ask themselves, how do I get out of this and try to throw it in reverse to save something that they are bound to shed eventually, thus postponing their awakening. This is not the way to go. If you want to get out of the dark night of the soul, then you go into it. You finish it. Stage three is considered rock bottom. Yeah, and by the way, sorry, this is gonna be a dark one, guys. This stage three consists of just being there within the rock bottom. I won't say to become comfortable with this as that's it's not possible, but instead to just accept this happening for what it's worth. Lay down and rest in the suffering. You will face the what is real part of yourself in your life, which is, is very hard to do. A person who is aware of what is happening does not try to control or drive the amount of suffering involved. At this point, we know we cannot run from our shadow. It is attached to our feet. So get to know it, say hello, and, and invite your shadow to brunch with your mother-in-law. At this point, it becomes known that this just might be some kind of purification. You are now the lead that is being tormented by sulfur, so to speak. So just wait. In stage four, an unfamiliar light begins to appear. This is not literal. It is something that you just feel. You don't know what it is yet. You don't all of a sudden get a life purpose, so to speak. You simply begin to understand that there is abundance and value within yourself that can be shared. Oh, we just don't know what. Yet. But it seems as though all patterns and subconscious traits are now clear as day and no longer avoided. And then having seen them, they break down. Stage five of this process is considered authentic seeking. You will become curious about new things as indeed you yourself are now new. You've accepted all of the things about yourself that you have been denying and things about the world that bother you and that you have avoided. Now that the fear is gone and you can seek and study in a much more real and authentic way. This is done without fear. We feel as if the lead previously mentioned might have turned to gold. Stage six is walking the path. This part is different for everyone. The results are vastly different for each person. That would make sense considering that in a way we have individuated as Jung would put it. Words fail at this point and wouldn't do any good anyway because when it happens, you just know. Your value and life's purpose will just be clear and unresistant. You will embody this philosophy all the way down to your bones. It is now you. It now takes no effort to evolve yourself and the things around you because 
you don't have to. You are now it instead of a bunch of words that point to it. This last stage makes me wonder if the first stage was sent to us in some kind of divine form or a message as a catalyst. So when you look back, it's as if it was supposed to happen and there's no longer grieving, loss, or regret. It is said that Christ descended to hell after crucifixion and spent three days there until resurrecting back to earth to teach what he learned before then ascending to heaven. Other theologians have translated this differently to say that he descended to the depths to preach his philosophy to quote, the imprisoned, the imprisoned. Reminding me a bit of the cube that his body died on. Could this all be allegory? So let's look at some of the history behind the concept of the metaphorical death and resurrection. The, the term initiation seems to paint a picture of some kind of esoteric ritual or Kabbalistic sect, when in fact it is more so based on the idea of becoming conscious. And as we have learned from Jung, there is no coming to consciousness without pain. In the archetype of initiation, the participant is oftentimes tried by his greatest fears and tested by his greatest greatest temptations. Initiation involves a kind of out-of-body experience, whether it be a classic OBE or a metaphor for releasing all bodily desires. Initiation seems to indicate a result of being aware of your own impulses and thus having complete and effortless control of oneself and a person's reaction to outside stimulus. These characters or beings that spread fear and temptation are not necessarily evil and are not demons, but instead elements of yourself being shown to you, gauging your reaction to yourself. This reminds me of the Mara depicted in the Tibetan Book of the Dead in which case involves literal death as opposed to our subject here of so-called ego death. But I mean, hey, as above, so below, right? I can't pronounce his name, but uh, Fang, his first name being H-S-U-E-H, -E is quoted as saying, the whole world is you, yet you keep thinking there is something else. This whole thing so far reminds me of Mithra, who plunged a dagger into the spine of the ox, which kind of represents the release of man from the animal nature. Book that I've been fucking with, Freddy Silva, the mind is affected and agitated in death, just as it is in initiation into the grand mysteries. The first stage is nothing but uncertainty, laborings, wanderings, and darkness. And now, arrived on the verge of death and initiation, everything wears a dreadful aspect. It is all horrors, trembling, and affrightment. But this scene, once over, a miraculous and divine light displays itself. Perfect and initiated, they are free. Crowned, triumphant, they walk in the regions of the blessed. It goes on to say, entering now into the mystic dome, he is filled with horror and amazement. He is seized with solicitude and total perplexity. He is unable to move a step forward, and he is at a loss to find the entrance to that void, which is to lead him to the place he aspires to. But now in the midst of his perplexity, the prophet or conducting hierophant suddenly lays open to him the space before the portals of the temple. I suppose hierophant there kind of alludes to the idea of a Zen master or a guru. Having thoroughly purified him, the hierophant now discloses the initiated to a region all over illuminated and shining with divine splendor. The cloud of thick darkness is dispersed and the mind, which before was full of disconsolate obscurity, now emerges into day, replete with light and cheerfulness out of the profound depth into which it had been plunged. And then uh, it points out here that seeing things with your own eyes can be referred to as autopsia. So kind of a cool word there. This is considered a living resurrection, so to speak. After the initiation, the participant no longer fears death or public scrutiny, as he is now completely whole and can have certainty in the midst of uncertainty. But it is also written that the reason for no longer fearing death is that the initiate has seen what lays behind it. This is very parallel to almost every near-death experience reported. People who have been resuscitated from death come back more alive than ever. They're 
their demeanor has now evolved from just living and surviving to complete agreement with what is, therefore a sort of a permabliss. Most surprising in near-death experiences, like initiation, the results that take place do not wear off over time, like the profound realizations that come from a hallucinogen or a psychedelic experience. My only hypothesis on this is the one glaring difference between an epiphany from hallucinogens and those from initiation, near-death experiences, are that in the case of plant drugs, something from the outside is changing your point of view, whereas in the case of initiation, the change occurs from within, literally tempering you with its Gnostic wisdom. In that way, this is Gnosis. Instead of receiving a message to learn from, we actually become that message and it becomes us. This doesn't necessarily eliminate hallucinogens from the equation, however, it can be utilized as a small portion of this recipe to enlightenment, but amongst other steps and trials. In fact, it was commonplace in ancient eastern parts of the world for people to leave the body using what was called alchemical narcotics. And I was very surprised to hear rumors about our buddy Lao Tzu. We don't know if Lao Tzu partook in this form of alchemy, but we do know that he would regularly leave his body to, quote, go for a stroll at the origin of things. Let me just say that again in case it didn't slap. Because the more you ponder that sentence, the more stunning it is. But yeah, our buddy Lao Tzu would often take his spirit for a stroll to the origin of things. Like, just like, holy shit. In Zoroastrian initiation, priests would leave their body to go on a quest of gathering information from the great library of the above worlds. This practice was very common, actually to many cultures, including the Maya, the Egyptians, but only undergone by the masters of this art, as an average person might not be able to download such information without going insane. It kind of sounds like a, a bit of a Lovecraft, almost, deal there. In Greece, we have the Eleusinian Mysteries, and it's believed to be very old, lasted quite some time, of considerable antiquity. This school of thought was intended to elevate man above the human sphere and into the divine, and to assure his redemption by making him or her divine, thus conferring, in a way, immortality upon him. Philosophers we have heard of, like Plato, partake in Eleusinian mysteries. Although it was held secret from governments, philosophers, hierophants, and, and even slaves alike were all invited to partake in this ritual. One of the only rules was that you couldn't go in twice, and supposedly you didn't have to. So uh, we don't know exactly what took place within the Eleusinian mysteries. We know that men left there having, quote, seen with their own eyes the divine source, and we know that there was a particular kind of brew involved in which we don't have the recipe anymore. But I mean, if you uh, if you look closely and kind of put the pieces together, you can kind of figure it out. Much like other hallucinogens, these men most likely encountered intelligence of non-human origin that became teachers to them. And in my own personal experience of interaction with what does sure seem to be like divine beings, I was met with a sort of tough love. The beings did not speak with a, a language or a voice as we find familiar, but instead a more simple and elegant method was used, symbols and notions. The language was direct as can be, because, I mean, well, after all, they were me. If I was to translate these messages into a language, it would certainly come out wrong, but, but of course, just like any other one of these sessions or experience, you want to write down the best you can what you went through and what you learned. And this is very roughly speaking, the message that I got was like, Man, you need to transmute that shit. Level the fuck up now because you are becoming. Every momentary action is building a character in the future, inside and out. You will see the consequences of your inner self soon in the outer world. They are the same thing. You are bound to cause an effect here and there is a reason for it. You are so overstimulated by outside occurrences that you can't feel the light within you. You are distracted from what actually matters. But it's right there and it's easy. All you have to do is shed everything you carry on your back. You don't need any of that shit. So, I mean, yeah, I, I definitely got yelled at. Uh, some people might call that the, the hyper slap there on the, uh, on the internet. 
Nevertheless, it goes to show that a bad trip can be a good trip if you are able to decipher it. Even though this message had no ties to any existing axioms, I was reminded of a Zen concept. A cup that is filled to the brim with liquid is it's heavy and not useful and growing more and more stagnant as time goes on. However, if that cup fails to stand on its own or is knocked down by some outside force, all of the liquid inside dumps out and is indeed quite the mess. This mess on the floor fucking sucks for sure. But after we clean it up, we can see now that the cup is empty and now has a purpose once again. It can be filled with better liquid this time, you know, like uh, Patron or uh, uh, Earl Grey tea, um, whatever <laughs> is your is your cup of tea. Maybe some of that weed tea that you all got now, I don't know. Whatever you want now has a place within the emptiness of this cup. Albert Mo and Einstein said, quote, the soul given to each of us is moved by the same living spirit that moves the universe. And I'd, I'd like to take a moment to point out that the most respected scientist of all time had just called the motions of the universe to be initiated by a living spirit, something that is alive and not human. The idea here is that within the cube, we are disconnected from divine. Here in this particular realm, and we're distracted by the pains, pleasures, and desires of the animal nature. Almost as if the entire purpose for being on Earth is to see through these illusions and rejoin the divine while in this, in this realm. This opens a kind of metaphysical portal for the divine to pierce into the lower gross realms through the initiate. In fact, the initiate is that portal. The initiate sees divinity for himself rather than hearing about it, thus Gnosis. He now has knowledge of the above, middle, and lower worlds. Chuanza is quoted as saying, when there is no separation between this and that, it is called the still point of the Tao. At the still point, in the center of the spiral, one can see the infinite in all things. And uh, another initiation seems to parallel the Dark Knight of the Soul archetype is the Native American process of the spirit quest. Like many other cultures, this process begins with isolation in remote parts of the wilderness. This is followed by sensory deprivation and starvation. Within the trauma of that self-inflicted pain comes a Gnostic experience of the true self. The self that is all human beings and also the self that is all living creatures. And last but not least, the self that is the individual's particular and unique path. In all cases, we have shed our skin to reveal the new and divine. We shed our skin, metaphorically speaking, of course, as unless you're a part of the Agora tribe who, to reach this state of gnosis, they conduct self-mutilation and, whew, and oh, golly, uh, read about that one. I can't believe I just said golly, what the, yeah. Everyone just changed the video. We shed our skin, metaphorically speaking, as this means many different things, including sacrificing everything that we think we are, everything we expect the world to be. You no longer have to change the world because you have changed yourself. Paradoxically, well, changing the world. Once we are divine, as opposed to speaking of divinity, a bubble forms that just cannot be penetrated by worldly things. In Christian theology, it is written that Christ spoke the words, except a man be born again, resurrection, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven or the true and purest form of self basically. And this seems to indicate that this process is important to undergo at some degree, lesser or more depending on the initiate. But let's be careful. At the beginning of this video, we compare this process to a slingshot, stating that the more we pull back the rubber strap, the more accelerated the rock flies. Thus, seemingly, the more suffering, the higher the sentient growth, like an accelerated evolution for consciousness. But Let's remember that if you pull the straps of that slingshot too far back, the straps will break. And well, anyone familiar with Friedrich Nietzsche doesn't need an explanation concerning that metaphor. We cannot force this. We have to let it find us. And until then, maintain and, and take good care of your sling.
Self-realization seems to tie together at least three of our seven hermetic laws, cause and effect being an obvious one. As above, so below, as we know that this death is metaphorical, yet the same principles seem to apply to literal death. And most importantly, our reoccurring theme of polarity, principle that seems to point to this idea that just like the slingshot our dark night of the soul or initiation or Alucinian mysteries or whatever else you may have it uh, the individuation confrontation with the shadow spirit quests all uh, all these different cultures have a different word for this same process that seems to indicate that the more we are tested the more we gain resolve and at some point there seems to be almost a bit of a, a breaking point that causes the person to in a way lose their mind or so they think at first but really while they're losing their mind just like our cup that lost its stagnant water it leaves them open to receive prana that when used carefully subtly and accepted brings out the best in a person quite literally through the worst in them when saint john of the cross suffered inside of that jail cell the literature that he came up with does not seem to be coming from a suffering man it doesn't seem to be sourced from pain in fact if anything the dark night of the soul is illumination from a man who has been inspired, inspired by humanity and from his own divine spark, in a way celebrating his untouchableness from the chaos of the outer world, considering that he now had this bubble of protection in which no worldly things could pierce. This cryptic yet religious and inspiring piece of literature from this man who simply had new ideas about the essence of what God is and inspiration to speculate upon previous notions that we have to accept that information gets updated and we cannot force ourselves to stick with previous ideals when presented with new information. And St. John of the Cross, I think, was kind of kind of the Copernicus or the Giano Bruno of religion. Whereas Copernicus and, and Giano Bruno were murdered or imprisoned because their ideas were so outside of the common norm that people were disturbed by it. But now we can definitively prove that both of them were correct. The Earth is not the center of the universe, and in fact, stars are suns with planets, as Gianno Bruno pointed out, and got burned at the fucking stake for it. The guy who discovered germs was imprisoned. They called him superstitious. And I mean, look at us today, obsessed with soap and toilet paper, you know? But St. John of the Cross, I do believe the same as Giano and Copernicus was onto something, but a bit deeper than what occurs in physical reality. His theories are, of course, incredible, but they're shadowed by his piece of literature that we'll check out now. It seems to be coming from a man who is eager to learn, eager to transmute, and eager to take an opportunity of absolute, desolute annihilation and turn it into something worth high value. This man turned lead into gold as well as any alchemist I can think of. Fear not.